Kia ora everyone. Good evening and welcome to the um, to the webinar about preparing for winter 2023. Uh, I'll just give you just give another few moments just for some extra people to join in. Uh, my name is Tom Orcheston. I work with Beef and Lamb New Zealand. I'm the Environment Capability Manager uh, for the South Island. And tonight our webinar will be about preparing uh, for winter 2023. Um, and I'd just like to thank our, our partners tonight. We've got Deer NZ, we've no, it's got mute. Deer Industry New Zealand, Federated Farmers, Foundation for Arable Research, Ministry for Primary Industries, and Beef and Lamb. So I'd just like to thank um, our, our, um, our partners tonight. And I'd also like to thank our speakers as well, um, who are representatives from some of these organisations. Uh, so without further ado, we will start in. I'll just give you a brief overview of what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to have a, um, a little bit of a chat about the farmer's perspective um, and, and why we should prepare and plan for 2023 now. We're going to talk about the rules and regulations, uh, animal welfare, paddock selection, uh, which will include critical source areas and measuring slope. We're going to have some research updates. I'd also just like to draw your attention um, that we will be taking questions at the end. We will hold all the questions to the end. But as we're going through, if you're able to submit your questions into the chat, it would be great. Um, if you haven't got the chat available, uh, you can see there's a number up on the screen there. Um, and you're welcome to text your uh, questions to that number, which is 027 702 9832. I'll just say that again, 027 702 9832. So if you've got any questions, um, pop them into the chat or text them in and we will cover those uh, at the end. <clears throat> uh, we're just going to run a poll, a very quick poll now. There's just two questions and we're just interested in knowing whereabouts you're based um, and also what your um, farm type is or what your role is if you're potentially a, a, a rural contractor or a rural professional. So if you're able just to um, add that in now, that should be up on your screen. If you just select the answers that are appropriate for your situation, we'll just give that um, I'll give another 20 or so seconds. That's great. We'll just give another few seconds. There's a few few people yet to come. That's great. So I can see we've got a range of uh, people from all over the country, right from the top of the North Island right through uh, to Southland. So that's great. And we've got a good number of uh, farmers in the room, which is great to see, and also some rural professionals as well. So thank you very much for, for that. Uh, we appreciate, uh, we appreciate um, you answering those poll questions. Uh, just in terms of the key points for the day, um, I will just quickly run through those. So first of all, we would like to, um, at, by the end of this, hopefully you're a little bit more aware of the new rules and regulations um, and how they are currently sitting. Um, another couple of things that we're keen to make sure farmers are thinking about uh, is um, in terms of you preparing a winter grazing plan. If you've got a winter grazing plan in place, um, it's really going to help you through the winter and manage uh, manage throughout the winter. Uh, looking after the animals, that's all around animal welfare. Um, always make sure that you're, you're taking good care of your animals and they've got the appropriate feed and shelter and so on. And also minimising your effects, uh, environmental effects on um, from, from winter grazing. I'm now going to um, get Jason Herrick to come on screen. Um, Jason, if you're able just to turn your camera on. Uh, Jason is a farmer from Mossbin in Northern Southland. He's also the spokesman for uh, winter grazing for Federated Farmers. And he's just gonna give a farmer perspective on preparation and planning for winter 2023. So I'll hand over to you now, Jason, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here representing Federated Farmers in, uh, in Southland and uh, I want to give a farmer perspective and from a Federated Farmers perspective uh, around preparing for winter 2023. 
Um, so the reason we want to um, promote this is so farmers have more certainty going forward because we all uh, want certainty going forward. Um, is nothing more um, uh, important than uh, having a good plan in place um, ready for the next winter. Um, we all need to understand the national and local rules and regulations. Now, um, Federated Farmers, Dairy NZ, Beef and Lamb uh, in particular have been advocating for farmers to get uh, better rules and regulations in place. Uh, we are still continuing that fight because we still believe they are far from perfect um, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, we do believe we need a, uh, a farm plan in place before the rules come in, uh, so we're currently working on that. Um, if you need uh, any support whatsoever to understand these local rules and regulations or have any questions, you can get support from Federated Farms, Beef and Land, Dairy NZ, MPI and your regional councils and other industry bodies like FAR and the dairy industry. Um, also, when you're going through this process from a farmer perspective, can you winter graze within the rules or will you need a resource consent? Um, and again, um, if you're uncertain of this, uh, you can reach out uh, to any of those organisations and they can also point you in the right direction. Um, also important for certainty that you have a wintering plan. Um, I encourage everybody, as do a lot of uh, these other folk, um, to have a wintering plan on, on paper um, and ensure um, that you have that uh, going forward because that can give you certainty. Uh, planning templates for this are available from Beef and Lamb, Dairy NZ and MPI or your local regional council. Next slide, please, Tom. So also uh, planning early. So that's why we want to do it now um, to get certainty going forward. So plan for the next winter now um, to manage your risks, um, identify them and so on. Also preparing for adverse events. Do you have a plan A or a plan B? Um, pretty simple or even a plan C. Uh, with the current uh, winter uh, weather we're currently having. Um, and also one thing I do is share it with the wider team, um, your staff on farm um, and your rural contractors because they're important. Uh, they're the ones gonna be doing your spraying and your cultivation, uh, making sure that they uh, have identified those critical source areas and buffer zones. Um, also very important uh, a part of winter is uh, looking after uh, the ground and the environment. So I'm a big fan of recycling uh, so baleage wrap is a huge issue, so uh, I encourage everybody to um, to recycle their bale wrap where they can um, and, uh, yeah, utilise that resource. Thank you very much, Tom. Great. Thanks very much for that, Jason. Really appreciate you um, you giving your insights into, into that uh, preparation uh, for winter 2023. So thank you very much. I'm now going to get uh, Heather Mackay uh, from Beef and Lamb New Zealand. She's the Environment Policy Manager. Uh, and Heather's going to give us a bit of a run through on the national rules and regulations in relation to winter grazing and where they currently sit. So I'll hand over to you now, Heather. Great, thanks, Tom, um, and good evening, everybody. So yeah, as Tom said, I'm going to uh, talk you through the national rules and regulations in relation to intensive winter grazing. Um, and to sort of set the scene for this, you know, we're all aware that uh, the National Environmental Standard for Fresh Water introduced these uh, regulations a couple of years ago, and they've been through, um, I guess, a couple of iterations with the changes that have happened. I'm not going to go through what they looked like in the changes tonight, but what they, uh, how they're legislated currently, so what's in place today. The other thing to note at the start here is that regional councils may have additional rules in their plans. So um, I'm just talking through the national regulations tonight, but just to always remind everybody to check their own uh, regional district council and make sure you're aware of, of the rules in your region. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So it'd be useful to start off with some definitions. Uh, there's a lot of definitions in the regulations, but I'm just going to go with um, two pretty key ones tonight so that we're very clear what we're talking about. So the first is around uh, what is intensive winter grazing in the context of these regulations. And it's around the grazing of livestock on an annual forage crop. Uh, so important there, it's about um, annual forage crops that are being grazed directly by livestock, not something that's being harvested and fed elsewhere. 
and also at any time in the period uh, between the 1st of May and the 30th of September uh, of that year. So there's a defined period in which these regulations apply. The second part that's really important is uh, understanding what is an annual forage crop. And again, it means a crop that's grazed in the place where it is grown, but um, importantly, it doesn't include pasture or any crop for arable or horticultural land use. Um, and in the context of what we're talking about, just understanding that pasture is not included is quite important. Next slide. In terms of the application of the regulations, so for uh, for farms where winter grazing has been occurring for some time, uh, the regulations apply to land on the farm that's been used for intensive winter grazing uh, during the period from June 2014 to June 2019. And this is referred to as the reference period throughout the legislation or the regulations. And the couple of key things there are uh, that the area on the farm that's used for intensive winter grazing must not be more than the maximum area that was used during the reference period. So it doesn't have to be the same paddocks on the farm, but it can't uh, be any more than the area that was used, the maximum area used during that reference period. And the regulations set out essentially three regulatory pathways for intensive winter grazing where it's previously existed. Uh, first is the freshwater farm plan. Uh, second is a permitted activity uh, status where conditions and standards are met, or thirdly, a resource consent process. And I'm going to go through the three of those and what they mean. Uh, also to note, if there is new intensive winter grazing or more than what's happened previously, then automatically that triggers the resource consent requirement. Next slide, please. So firstly, looking at the freshwater fa uh, farm plan pathway. So in in, under the regulations, intensive winter grazing uh, is a permitted activity if it's undertaken in accordance with a freshwater farm plan. But what we're all aware of is that this pathway is not actually currently available. So um, Jason alluded to that actually just before when he was talking that even though it's in the legislation, the freshwater farm plan regulations aren't yet available. So essentially this, uh, this pathway is not yet available. The indications that we've had um, from MFE is that from next year, this will um, start to be available and roll out over several years, uh, but we don't as yet know which regions are going to be first and quite how that's going to happen. So moving on from that, uh, currently all other conditions or standards must be met for uh, intensive winter grazing to be a permitted activity. So if we go to the next slide, please, and we'll uh, look at what those are. So there's six uh, conditions or standards which need to be met for intensive winter grazing to be permitted, in other words, so that it can be undertaken without requiring a resource consent. So the first is around area, uh, which says that there can be no greater than 50 hectares or 10% of the farm uh, under intensive winter grazing, whichever is greater. Um, so that's important, it's the greater of the two. The second is around slope, so any land under that annual forage crop for intensive winter grazing has got to be a maximum of 10 degrees or less, and that's measured over any 20 metre distance. And I just note that uh, later in the presentation we will talk briefly about uh, ways to measure slope and tools that can be used. Thirdly, waterways, uh, so livestock must be kept at least five metres away from the bed of any waterway, so any river, lake, wetland or drain, and that's regardless of whether there's water in that water body at the time or not. Next one is around critical source areas, so uh, critical source areas must not be grazed, uh, they must not be cultivated with annual forage crops and the ground cover in those must be maintained at all times, so that's around identifying those critical source areas and uh, making sure that they are excluded from your winter grazing area. Uh, pugging, so um, yeah, this is one that, that definitely did change, but now pugging is around all reasonably practical steps have got to be taken to minimise uh, adverse effects on fresh water from pugging. So um, that's around kind of management as, as the intensive winter grazing progresses. And then the final one is around ground cover. So vegetated ground cover has got to be established as soon as practicable after the grazing of the winter crop is completed. Okay, next slide, please. So 
those six uh, standards or conditions that I just quickly ran through, if all of those can be met, then intensive winter grazing is a permitted activity um, for where it's happened in the past um, and resource consents not required. However, if any one of those conditions is not met, then resource consent is required uh, from your regional council. And that's a restricted discretionary consent, which essentially means that there's a list of uh, matters of discretion that are written into the regulations and they're the only things that the council can consider uh, when they're considering your resource consent. Now, I, I haven't listed them here, but they're essentially around things like effects on, uh, effects on fresh water from the activity. Now, if the area under intensive winter grazing is going to increase to more than the maximum area during the reference period, which was that uh, 2014 to 2019 period, then that also triggers the requirement for resource consent, uh, which is discretionary, which essentially means the councils have a wider um, scope for consideration. Uh, and then also if there's going to be any new intensive winter grazing activity on a farm where it hasn't previously occurred, then consent is required. Did just want to note that those increase in area or new area rules uh, are set to be revoked by 31st of December 2024. And the reasoning um, behind that is that's the date by which all the regions have to have their updated fresh or new freshwater, uh, freshwater plans and policies notified. And I guess the assumption is that um, regions can make their decisions about what they include there. Next slide, please, Tom. So the resource consent process, if, uh, if, you do to, if you do need a resource consent or think that you might need a resource consent, um, really encourage you to talk to the regional council uh, early, in the, early in the process and take guidance from them. Um, many of the regional councils are starting to develop specific intensive winter grazing consent application forms. So uh, find out if, if a particular form exists uh, and complete that form. The process will take 20 working days from the time of application, just noting that it can stop if a council requires further information or any written approvals uh, for the application. And I'll just note that um, pr provided that the intensive winter grazing is well managed and um, manages effects well, then it's likely that consent would be granted with conditions uh, that the council can impose and monitor. So I've just put a resource there that you can link to with a bit more information as well. And next slide, please. Um, and just, I guess, a couple of final comments from me. Um, just remembering, like I said at the start, that your regional council might have additional roles to consider and talking to them early will be, um, will be helpful in that process. Uh, and I also just wanted to note that we've seen really good on the ground process, uh, progress around intensive winter grazing this year. So despite the fact that the regulations uh, don't take effect until the 1st of November this year, um, the reports, particularly out of the Southern South Island councils from their winter flyovers are looking really positive. Um, so that's something, you know, that's something to be proud of and, and to note. Um, and also just echoing what Jason mentioned at the start is that, um, you know, they, these changes are currently legislated, but because the freshwater farm plan rules are not, um, not available for use as yet, uh, it, you know, we're really not happy with that and are looking to how we can continue to push back um, against uh, against everything kicking in prior to that freshwater farm planning process or a useful alternative being available. So I'll just hand back over to you, Tom. Great, thank you so much, Heather, uh, for providing um, a, a really good um, summary of where the rules and regulations at that national level currently are. And yeah, I think it's good to good to make sure that we um, remember that uh, you know the, there might be local and regional differences. Uh, so yeah, it's important to make sure that um, that people are thinking about that and, and getting in touch with their local regional councils where appropriate. So thank you, Heather. Uh, our next speaker is Tony Paku. Uh, Tony is the um, team leader for animal welfare and NAIT compliance with uh, Ministry from Primary uh, Ministry for Primary Industries. So I'll just hand over to you now, Tony, and um, you can give us a bit of an update on uh, the MPI perspective and animal welfare. Uh, Tina Koto, my name is Tony Pucker, and as I said, uh, the large my, my discussion has a very Southland Otago kind of a flavour uh, as a result of some of the um, work and stuff we've been doing out here for the last four seasons. 
Uh, the first thing I'd say to the group is that um, winter grazing uh, is not just a Southland thing. Um, however, um, some information that came onto line about four years ago um, created the emphasis to actually start a group and to run some work into, into intensive winter grazing in the Otago Southland area and uh, largely had oversight from the minister. Um, some of the things that we started off with was actually engaging with our stakeholders. And so it's not only the beef and lambs and the dairy NZs and, and all of our other major stakeholder bodies. We actually started a lot closer to the ground level, uh, meeting with farmer groups, going to farmer focus days, and then trying to get some understanding and to try and build a bit of a relationship uh, in relation to uh, what inter intensive winter grazing is about. And I guess some of the things that we were wanting to do as part of our compliance um, sort, of, sort of work over the stuff. Uh, just, just so that you're clear, the, the animal welfare uh, component of the MPI compliance, we're one of four sectors, so there's people that look at the people component of it, uh, there's other things that look at the policies and the guidelines, there's also stuff that looks into the science, so when you're dealing with us, um, you know, we are just simply there just, to, just for the um, welfare concerns for the animal. Um, probably the most important thing in terms of the use of the experts uh, is that actually you guys are the experts on the property. Uh, you know your animals, you know your farms, and so all of these things that have been wrapped around the intensive winter grazing work, uh, like winter having, um, you know, winter plans that have been recorded, uh, making sure that we've got back fences, making sure we've got using portable troughs and stuff when we can, um, is all sort of part that's sort of grown with us. Um, Tom, next slide, please. So what we kind of did down here is that we actually uh, created um, two sorts of inspections. So a lot of them in the early parts that were proactive inspections. Uh, this stuff involved us going out on farm. Uh, some of the things that we were seeing were, uh, you know, making sure that guys have winter plans and that that stuff was uh, clearly cumulable to across all staff members. Uh, we've seen real huge um, gains in that area where a lot of the plans and stuff we're seeing now are actually digitized. They're actually on walls that have been laminated. Uh, they fixed the tables and stuff in the smoke room and all that sort of thing. So quite a long way from where we started uh, four seasons ago. Um, a big drive for, for us has actually been getting um, people to tell their staff exactly what was going on, just so that if there was any opportunity for the owner or the, or the person in charge to not be on farm, that they actually everybody knew what was sort of going on. And a small component actually has been looking at the NAIT requirements of, of um, you know, your stock in terms of the movements required, especially for our dairy cattle and things like that too. Uh, just in relation to the reactive jobs, so a lot of our jobs come through calls uh, that are um, put through to our call centre and then we actually go out and work uh, these jobs and work out what's going on. Um, a lot of these things are from people driving past the road, so it's actually a lot of that visual kind of aspect where a lot of the early days, those were the sorts of things that people were seeing, they'd seen animal, they said mud, and all of a sudden it's, it's animals and mud. Um, the visual aspect has actually been probably the most um, contentious issue. Um, because quite often, uh, well, actually what I've learned over the last few years is that when you see an animal of mud, there's actually quite a lot of things that we're taking into consideration now that uh, we've probably learned as our work has sort of gone on through. So when we're looking at a break, we're not worried just about what's happening at the feed phase. We're looking at three days before, we're looking to see what's going on. We're looking to see what sort of uh, areas are there where animals have potentially been lying down. We're looking to see whether or not people have got back fencing for argument's sake. So. Yeah, the whole reactive thing is actually us still working with the farmers and uh, looking through. And a lot of the um, jobs that have come through, especially this year, have actually shown that, uh, you know, this year has been an absolutely cracker year for as far as we've been concerned. Uh, this time last year, we had 104 jobs that we'd done from a reactive point of view. Uh, this year, we've had uh, 57 jobs in total that we've done. Uh, with about 45 of those jobs actually being proactive jobs. Um, look, the weather hasn't been fancy down here in Southland, but certainly everything that's gone in and, and everything that I've seen, because I've said every year it's been an incremental change, but this year has actually been through the roof in terms of how, we're guys, how well guys have actually prepared, how the farms have been set up, and more notably, we've seen a lot more uh, sort of grass-fed sort of situations. So uh, look, we're really pleased with how the season has gone on down south. Last one, thanks, Tom. I think the main thing for us is that uh, the Winter Grazing Advisory Group set out seven recommendations, and all of this is actually uh, information from the link that you see below. Uh, the key things when we're looking at when we come on farm is that uh, actually, you know, you're all prepared for all weather conditions. That's having that plan A, plan B, plan, uh, plan C's and so on. We're looking to make sure that the, uh, that the animals have got uh, early access and acceptable drinking water. Uh, we're looking to ensure that the animals and stuff can lie down uh, comfortably and plenty of signs of that with the bowls and things that we've seen a lot of this year has been great. But probably one of the more important things is just ensuring that any animals and stuff that are, um, you know, they're giving birth on the pads or in your, or in your feeding areas are actually taken away from those areas uh, as soon as possible. So um, 
just that resource, that, that link that you see down the bottom there. If you wanted to know a little bit more about this, then you can find all your information there. Thanks, Tom. Great, thank you very much, Tony. Really appreciate uh, you giving that uh, MPI perspective there. So thank you very much. Uh, and I think, yeah, it's gonna be really important that uh, people making sure that they look after their animals, make sure they've got the appropriate feed, shelter, water, uh, and doing what they can to, to reduce that mud, which obviously at this time of year is gonna be a really hard thing to do. Uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker now. We've got Justin Kitto. He's the Dairy and Z Lead Advisor. Uh, and Justin's going to talk to us about uh, some of the considerations around paddock selection. So Justin, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Tom. So um, yeah, that's some positive stuff coming out of both Heather and Tony. And now, given we're moving into that crop establishment part of the season, now's a critical time to start thinking about paddock selection and, and how we set ourselves up so we keep getting that positive feedback. feedback. So one of the first ones is around those um, physical elements, those natural characteristics of the farm. So if you really want to avoid a consent, having to pay for that, um, an ideal paddock will have less than 10 degrees slope. It'll have good soils that have good drainage characteristics. There'll be no waterways around in them or through them um, and keeping those critical source area um, minimum or avoiding them if possible. And that would be the perfect paddock and um, that would minimise or eliminate that need for consent. So those are the things that you should be really looking for. Um, and as Tony has indicated, it's not all about environment. Animals are an important element in this conversation as well. So selecting paddocks that have shelter, that have opportunities to mo move animals off the paddock in case that weather really packs in but also um, the, the type of food that you're giving them. And as Dawn's going to talk about later, there's some um, emerging evidence around cultivation techniques and how that can impact the amount of mud um, that you do, do or do not generate and the implications of that. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So one of the things that we're starting to get a few questions around is, is how do you measure slope? So Ministry for Environment is not going to be producing um, any maps or anything like that around slope. So it's up to individuals to figure out if, if they're above or below the um, 10 degree slope. So one of the easy techniques that you can use today is, um, is download an app on your phone that there's, um, you can search for inclinometer, angle meters, level, level apps, things like that. They're all available for free. And, and they're pretty, they're reasonably effective to a high degree. Um, and just to remember, it's 10 degrees over a 20 meter length. So um, a good way, I was using it the other day and I was lining up fence lines and tree lines, things like that, trying to get an appreciation of what the slope is. Um, but if you really want to get into it, um, a couple of standards, 20 metres apart, tie some rope off and use that angle metre and, you, and you'll be good to go. But also um, tractors have incliner metres in them and things like that. So they're, they're the sorts of tools that, that, are, that are freely available today to help you make that decision. Next slide, please, Tom. Um, the other part of the rules, which is a lot more subjective and a bit more tricky, is these things called critical source areas. And they do tend to stick out a lot more after a lot of rain, which we've been um, recently having. So um, critical source areas, the landscape features such as swales or gullies, they are depressions in the landscape where water accumulates. And when that water accumulates and it starts running off, it can take contaminants with it. So they're quite a significant source of contaminant. Um, and ideally, we want to be leaving these uncultivated and ungrazed through that winter period to really reduce that risk of contaminant loss. Um, but the other thing is to really um, understand that the farm team knows why you're doing it and that these features have been left alone for a reason. Um, you know, you, you're doing, you might be doing a wonderful job leaving it ungrazed, uncultivated, um, but then when tractors get driven up and down it or mobs of animals, get moved through it and it turns into a bit of a boggy mess that sort of defeats the purpose. So it's really important to, to make the team aware of why you're doing it. Next slide, please, Tom. Um, and we've just got some examples of, of what these features are in, in case you're unsure of them. So here we've got an example and you can quite clearly see that, that there's water in the bottom of it. Um, and, and that's the sort of part of the paddock we're wanting to protect. Next slide, please, Tom. 
And here's another example of perhaps a bit more benign. Um, but again, um, that's, the, that's the type of um, area you want to be leaving alone and informing the, the tractor drivers and the spray contractors that you want these parts of the paddock left alone, even if they do bisect a paddock. And here goes a slightly more extreme example of, of what a critical source area looks like. Next slide, please, Tom. Um, the other rule is around buffers. So a minimum, a minimum of a five meter buffer around all waterways, um, and that does include drains. Um, that doesn't mean your permanent fence has to be set back that far. It's just a temporary fence will be sufficient. Um, and again, those parts of the paddock, that five meter buffer has to be maintained intact the whole season. Otherwise, if it's grazed, it, again, it defeats the purpose. Um, Tom, next slide. Um, and here go some other considerations. These, apart from the re-sowing and catch crops, these are, um, these are some extra things that you can do that are, that are considered good practice. Um, so things like back fencing, where you place your water troughs, using portable water troughs, where you put your supplementary feed, um, keep them out of those critical source areas, those swales, because they're prone to getting a bit muddy, which we, which we don't want to see. Um, and again, re-sowing and the potential use of um, catch crops if they're applicable to your um, soil conditions. Um, and as Tony indicated earlier, um, you know, that's not just about the environment. Animal care is very important as well. It's equally important. Um, so these are some of the things that farmers are starting to use, some of the management techniques farmers are using to manage their animals through those wet periods to minimise the amount of mud that's generation, generated to allow stock that those opportunities to lie down. I won't read them all out, but there are some of the um, examples that are, that are being used by farmers at the moment to quite good effect. Next slide, Tom. Oh, I'm done. There we go. Great. Thanks very much for that, uh, Justin. That's really, really great to get uh, a perspective there in terms of some of the things that can be done practically uh, to help out with, you know, that paddock selection and, and preparing for, for next winter, winter 2023. So thank you very much, Justin. Really appreciate that. I'm going to now introduce our next speaker, uh, Dawn Daly. Um, Dawn is a senior scientist with Dairy New Zealand, and uh, she's going to give us a bit of an update on some of the wintering research and uh, some of the projects that are that are going on at the moment. So I'll hand over to you, Dawn. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, as Tom said, I'm just going to briefly cover three research projects that are either in um, progress at the moment or have been recently. Uh, completed and that have the results of which have implications in terms of how we need to be setting up our crop paddock. So the first one is being run by Ag Research and funded by um, Ministry for Primary Industries and it's looking at um, determining the effectiveness of strategic grazing around those critical source areas on uh, water quality. So this is um, a similar project to the one that was done at Telford with dairy cows a number of years ago we're looking at the impact of, in this case, sheep grazing on those soil physical properties. And it's a paired catchment study. So looking at um, what is the reduction in nutrient loss if we keep animals out of those uh, critical source areas. Next slide, thanks, Tom. So as I mentioned, um, some of the research is still ongoing and this is one of the projects that's in its third year. So they're just completing the third year of measurements as um, like right now. So pre only preliminary data at the moment, but what um, they are able to say is that critical source area management is definitely helping to reduce the contaminant yields. And hopefully within the next six months or so, they'll, um, with this year's data, be able to quantify um, just by how much that is um, able to be achieved. The other thing that they have observed is that the majority of the runoff um, and the contaminant losses are actually occurring after the grazing. And that's due to the, um, the loss of the vegetative cover and the soil treading damage. Um, even with sheep, we're seeing that increase in contaminant loss. Uh, in terms of the implications for setting up for um, winter 2023, 20, as has already been outlined, um, 
needing to be avoiding cultivating those critical source areas and establishing them in crop. And then when it comes to grazing them, um, keeping the animals and the tractors uh, out of them, so protecting that area. Uh, given that a lot of the loss occurs after the grazing, um, looking at replanting that paddock as soon as possible. So um, if there are opportunities, even if it's in some paddocks on the farm, to look at catch crops uh, going in, then um, thinking about that and setting up for winter. And um, I guess one of the risk areas is um, those critical source areas when you come to replanting them back in um, pasture after that winter period. So uh, looking at ways to um, minimise any soil or nutrient loss um, during that replanting time. Thanks, Tom. The next uh, research was some research that was done in conjunction with Ag Research uh, at the Southern Dairy Hub um, in winter 2020. And this was really looking at assessing soil conditions uh, for better uh, uh, welfare outcomes in our, in, for dairy cattle. And so what we were looking at was um, trying to identify some, some simple indicators that farmers could be using to assess when the paddock conditions were getting to a point that they were starting to impact on welfare. So looking using things like the gumboot score, uh, the proportion of the paddock with surface pooling, uh, pugging depth and also soil, mesh, uh, soil moisture. And uh, we were using a couple of different behavior devices to um, assess the lying time of the animals. Thanks, Tom. So what did we see um, with this research? So uh, two graphs here, the top graph, uh, the blue bars in the top graph are the rainfall events through the study. So it was a, um, a 31 day study. You can see that um, we did have probably about 80% of the days that we did have rainfall events, ranging from less than a millimetre up to um, 12 millimetres. In the bottom graph is the average lying time of the animals either on fodder beet, which is the solid line, or kale. So you can see that um, wobbling along around between sort of eight and, and um, 12 hours. But at day 10, where we had that four millimetre rainfall event, you can see that there is a drop off in lying time in both of those treatments. However, when we get to day 17, when there's been um, an accumulation of rain over that week period, we can see a significant drop in the lying time. So that's indicating that once those soils are saturated, it doesn't take much rain um, to really change those lying conditions and impact animal welfare. Thanks, Tom. So when we looked at all of the measurements that we, would, um, we took, there was lots of interacting factors, um, but in terms of um, what affected lying time the most, it was actually the surface pooling on the paddock, and that was very closely linked to the rainfall. Thanks, Tom. The other thing that we observed was that uh, with our measurements, the area closest to the feed face remained the driest, um, even in really wet conditions. So when we're setting up our paddocks, um, need to think about protecting this area during those weather events. And you can see in the photo on the right hand side, the, um, the pugging in that paddock is not particularly deep, but we've got significant surface pooling and the animals are either standing or lying on that drier ground that has been the, the feed that's been offered that day. Thanks, Tom. So in terms of the implications of this research for paddock selection and establishment, uh, really encourage um, farmers to be thinking about matching the stock class and crop type to individual paddocks um, to minimize that soil damage and water pooling. So most farms will have a range of soil types. So thinking about um, what, what crop type um, and the yield of that is best matched um, to those, those individual paddocks. Uh, as um, was mentioned by Justin, there's a number of different ways that we can um, establish crops. So thinking about are there minimum till options that could be used to help maintain the soil structure and consider the grazing direction when planting the crop. And especially if um, uh, rows are being used to allocate bulb crops. So thinking about where the prevailing weather is coming from and where do we want our long um, rows of crop to be able to um, provide the best conditions. And the other thing is identifying those contingency options for each paddock. Thanks, Tom. Can we go back one, please? <laughs> um, so, and just in terms of um, contingency planning, what we're seeing quite a lot of um, emerging recently is these breakout zones within crop paddocks. 
So these are grass strips that are left behind that are utilised um, during those adverse weather events. So in terms of setting up the paddocks, we need to be thinking about that um, right at the start before the spray contractor comes in. So they need to be um, not sprayed out and or cultivated. We need to be thinking about how they're going to be managed prior to that winter period. So thinking about, um, because they are a larger area, how we're going to get in and harvest the pasture in them, um, making sure we can still access to, to spray the crop. And then how are the animals going to be able to access those areas um, during grazing? And the other thing is in terms of just the location within the paddock avoiding those any lower lying areas um, or critical source areas. And if there's the opportunity to put these in the dry and more sheltered areas, then that's definitely preferable. Thanks, Tom. And so the last uh, study that I'm gonna talk about was a hedgehog, the hedgehog Makariwa catchment study. Um, so it was a cross sector pilot study uh, funded by Thriving Southland. And this was um, the group looking to see whether minimum till establishment could provide better soil conditions during winter grazing. So there were 11 farms across Southland, so a mix of dairy, uh, dairy grazing and um, sheep and beef farms, and there was also a study at the Southern Dairy Hub. As I mentioned, it is a pilot study and um, we did measure a number of different soil and crop conditions both pre and um, post grazing and um, got lots of really good intel from the farmers involved as well. Next slide, thanks Tom. So in terms of the key observations, um, it wasn't a replicated study. So, but with some of the learnings that we had were um, around the minimum till establishment, really important to think about the paddock history in terms of um, successful establishment. So is it a badly pugged paddock? Has it been used as a springer paddock? Cause that will affect um, the, the conditions um, during sowing. The other thing is those soil conditions during sowing. So um, because you want to get that uh, good uh, soil seed contact, um, because we haven't got a really fine seed bed, making sure that um, it's not too wet or too dry um, when it's, the crop is planted and thinking about the timing of spraying. And uh, because we haven't buried um, the weeds or the pests, there is increased um, weed and pest pressure. So being really timely with um, any sprays. Interestingly, with the uh, minimum to established crops um, at the Southern Dairy Hub, we did measure uh, less pugging damage, but um, on our soil type, we actually got increased risk of surface pooling. And as I mentioned in the previous study, surface pooling was one of the, um, the drivers for lower lying times. So while we might not have as deep um, pugging, we need to be thinking about the surface pooling as well. And I guess um, with this, it's um, like a lot of uh, pilot studies has raised a lot more questions. And um, we're currently in the process of um, developing a, a larger program of work for this. But what we can conclude is that minimum till establishment will not be a silver bullet for poor winter management. Um, so we need to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're getting good winter management um, being implemented across all of our farms. Thanks, Tom. Great, thanks so much for that, Dawn. That's uh, really great to get a, a um, an insight into some of the research that's going on and in, into uh, intensive winter grazing at the moment. And it sounds like there's some um, uh, some really good results coming out uh, from that research, which will be hopefully be able to be shared out um, to everybody. This brings us now to our next um, yeah. our next part of. Uh, all about uh, questions and so look if, if we've got a few questions that have already come into the chat so I encourage you to uh, use that chat function now and add add your questions in there and we will endeavor to get through as many as we can um, with the with the remaining um, minutes that we've got um, also if you're unable to put them into the chat uh, please text them to 027 702 9832 027 702 9832 and so either of those options is fine uh, if you would like your questions in there. Um, I'm going to just start the questions off now we've got a few that have already come through. Uh, there's a few for Heather here so I might just get Heather if you're able just to bring your um, uh, bring your video up. Fantastic thank you. So the first one is um, uh, does, does, does an area with tall drains 
or drain coil meet the definition of a critical source area? Okay, so um, in the definitions of these regulations uh, around drain, so it's not specifically around critical source areas, um, but uh, where the standards and conditions that I talked through refer to drains, the regulations specifically exclude any underground drain from that definition. So um, ba based on that, for, for um, anything that refers to drains, then no, they wouldn't be included. Right. I'd add, sorry, Tom, that if oh. the tile drain is, you know, under the depression in the landscape, so it's in that swale, and that, that swale needs to be managed, but it's not the tile drain itself. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks for adding in there, Justin. Appreciate that. Um, there's a few other questions we've got coming in. Um, one of the questions uh, someone's asking, how much will the resource consent cost and how long will it last for? Yeah, um, if that's a, if that's a question for me, um, I'm not entirely sure I can answer how much it will cost. Um, you know, that will be somewhat regional council dependent. Um, but yeah, I look, I would anticipate anywhere in the sort of low to medium thousands of, of dollars, but I am taking a bit of a stab in the dark at that. Um, the second part of that question is around how long it will last. And we've got to see yet how councils are going to be granting these. But I'd certainly be looking um, and suggesting people are applying for a period of several years um, and not looking for a consent every single year. So looking to apply to cover multiple areas on a farm, um, not applying every year for every paddock. Great. Now I see Jason is, is on screen there. Jason, were you wanting to add something on there? Yeah, so the consent process for this stage, um, cost-wise, uh, that we've got an indication is between $1,700 and $2,000 for the initial consent application, um, and that's just the deposit. So it could be more from there. Great, thanks for um, thanks for that. I'm just going to look in there, see what other questions we've got. And um, is here's another one for you, Heather, or potentially for you, Heather, or maybe Justin. Um, is inten intensive winter grazing only stock graze behind a wire? Uh, well, uh, intensive winter grazing, I'll see if Justin's got anything to add to this, but intensive winter grazing, if we look at the definition, it's around the grazing of annual forage crops. So uh, I guess the size of your break doesn't necessarily matter it's that it's that definition around um is it an annual forage crop sure okay thank you um and uh there's another one here um someone wanted just a bit of clarification is an annual crop um on, on a cropping farm is grazed over winter because it's an arable crop it does not fall under the annual forage crop definition if it's grazed by animals in situ it would but if it's harvested and fed elsewhere then then no yeah okay so it's, it's really talking about that in situ grazing is yeah, that right the, yeah the definition's definitely around the grazing of animals uh at the location of the crop sure and directly so, on the crop sure and someone's just actually asked if if we can just revisit that um grazing definition um of the annual forage crop and intensive winter grazing. I'm not sure if you've got that in front of you right now. Have you got that in front of you? Uh, no, I don't have that in front of me right now. It is, um, it is in the slides, but essentially it's around the that definition of intensive winter grazing is around the grazing of animals directly on that annual forage crop between, uh, between that period from 1st of May until the 30th of September in, a, in any given year. Sure, okay. Um, and here's one about heli cropping. Is heli cropping an option on steep land um, to help get resource consents? Is this something that's been talked about? Maybe you can have a crack at that, Heather, and if, if anyone else wants to jump in after Heather, they're more than welcome. Yeah, look, I'm not sure if I've actually got an answer to, to this, Tom. I'd have to understand a bit more what was involved, but I guess in general where people aren't meeting those standards or conditions so they're looking for a resource consent uh, what they need to be looking to demonstrate is how they're managing 
um, their crop, and that does include, for consenting, that does include the ground preparation and sowing, um, how they're managing it to uh, mitigate or minimise any environmental impacts. Sure, and I, yeah, I guess in terms of, um, you know, that preparation and not having that cultivation phase uh, or traditional cultivation phase might help on that. J Jason, you've jumped in there. Do you want to contribute in? Yeah, I think uh, that answer, uh, that question can be answered uh, by contacting your regional council because every regional council have a different um, definition of, of what is entailed in that. So yeah. to answer the question, I would be contacting your regional council on that one. Yep. yep. Great advice, and because there will be there will be regional differences between um, different councils, so good advice there. Uh, another one here: uh, Can you use the same paddock for intensive winter grazing every year if you sow a cover, cover crop after grazing? I'm I'm not sure if that's a rules and regulation question for me, Tom, or if it's a, a actual paddock management and crop establishment question. I, yeah, I think it might be both. So maybe if you're able to answer from that regulatory side, yeah, from, I might, from, might get Dawn or Justin from, to have a crack. Yeah, from it. the regulatory perspective, uh, providing it can tick all of those conditions and standards, then in theory, there's no reason why not. Whether you can tick all those conditions and standards on an ongoing basis, um, I'm, I'm not so sure that's perhaps something that um, Dawn or someone else might be able to talk about, actual paddock management. Sure. Dawn, do you want to jump in there? I'm not sure that I do want to jump in, but I will. Um, I guess, yeah, so um, probably the, the downside of that would be from an agronomic perspective. Mm -hmm. And could you um, continue to achieve the yields that you needed for your feed budget? And the, I guess the risk of um, ongoing or more soil damage and also um, pests and diseases. So um, yeah, that would probably be the only thing that I'd say in terms of um, cropping year on year in the same paddock. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, here's one for Justin or potentially for Justin. Um, is the slope the steepest part of a paddock, the average part of a paddock or the flattest part? Um, the, the slope rule is the maximum, so a maximum of 10 degrees over any 20 metre length. Um, but if but it doesn't, if any part of the paddock is over 10 degrees, it doesn't rule out the entire paddock. So if there are paddocks that are parts of the paddock that are less than 10 degrees, you can use those parts of the paddock. It's only those that are steeper than 10 degrees. Um, over a 20 metre length where you'll need to come in for a consent. Sure. So and so just to be clear, that's that's that average slope over that 20 metre length. Maximum. Maximum, okay. Yeah. Great. Um, did, did anyone else want to contribute into that question? Um, so I guess I would just make the comment. So it's almost like we're um, uh, treating that area over um, the, the 10 degrees like a critical source area. So you would have to stay out of that in terms of um, cultivating and, and grazing. But um, as Justin said, the rest of the paddock, if it was less than 10 degrees, um, could still be cropped. Sure, okay, thank you. Um, Dawn, I might get you to sing, seeing as you're, you're on there, um, I'll, I'll get you to have a crack at this one and also here they might get you to tune in there too. If using a multi-species crop that has annuals and perennials, does this still meet the definition of an annual forage crop? Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that one. Um, I might pass over to Heather. She's probably got more knowledge in that area. Okay, Heather. Yeah, um, look, this is actually a really tricky one to answer, to be honest, and it may be something that we're looking for um, guidance from, um, from the Ministry on as well, because the definition um, just says grazing of any, any annual forage crop um, by animals in situ, essentially, so whether it is uh, mixed in a multi-species crop uh, is not actually clearly defined, so um, yeah, we, that might be something that we need to uh, take away and see if we can get any further clarity on. Sure, um, Jason. I'm just wondering if you've got any, mm. if you've had any um, any comments on that question. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I think Heather's covered it. 
quite well in that, Tom, to be honest. Yeah, okay. Um, All right. Yeah, there's not, yeah, the rules <laughs> quite clearly state the definition around forage crops. Yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. Um, now, we're just, I'm just looking at the time there. We've got another few minutes left, so we've probably got time for a few more questions. Um, <clears throat> The definition of an annual forage with the annual forage crop, uh, can a multi-graze crop be considered an annual crop? Oh, we've, sorry, we've already covered that one. Um, sorry, we've got that in there twice. Um, we've got another couple of questions down here. Um, here's one for Tony. Um, Tony, what does MPI do when they come on farm and what are they mainly looking for? Yeah, so look, we, we follow um, a pretty prescriptive inspection assessment, and uh, we've actually shared that with industry. So all of our industry partners, Beef and Lamb, Farm, Frontier, Dairy and Z, and also Fed Farmers, as well as all of our local milk providers. Uh, they, and I'm only really speaking from a Southland point of view. Uh, so look, it, it should be of no surprise to any of our farmers on there. Uh, the main things actually is to try to sort of try and get a bit of a feel for what's happening uh, on the farm at that present time, because at the, the day that we're there is just really a snapshot of what's actually occurred um, over the wintering season to date. Look, we, um, as we said before, look, we're looking at the water, we're looking at the food and what's been available to the animals. Uh, we're looking for dry areas where they can actually lie down. Uh, we're talking, having discussions with the farmer or the person in charge of the animals in relation to um, you know, what's going on, the actual plan for the season. Uh, we're looking for, in the dairy industry, for example, calving dates and things like that and what the farmers and stuff plans are. So it's not just a, a one type thing that we're looking at. We're looking at an all encompassing kind of inspection on the farm and the information as it relates to your farm on the day. Uh, if there are follow up work uh, that needs to be done, then that's just being with the farm as we're going through. Great, thanks, Tony. Uh, there's one here for, for Justin. Um, what, what ideas have you got about how to best manage stock around critical source areas? Um, I'll happily open it up to other people that got better ideas than me, but I think that the easiest one straight off the bat would be just to have a temporary fence around that swale. But um, yeah, there's bound to be better ideas than what I've got, so I'm keen to hear them as well. Sure, has any of, the, any of the panel got anything else they want to comment on that one? Yeah, I guess um, there's a couple of things. It depends, uh, I guess, what your aim is. If you're aiming to meet the permitted activity condition around it, then you, you need to um, make sure that stock are well excluded and that that area is um, uncultivated, ungrazed. If you're looking at a consenting process where you may not be meeting all of those things, then you really need to be looking for mechanisms to um, manage any contaminant loss from that. Um, and, and I guess different things will play into that, like um, uh, slope and distance from waterways and and all of that that kind of those kind of management assessments sure thanks thanks Heather there's just one one more um in here have we got any idea of when this when the freshwater farm plans will be available yeah I can just carry on with that if you like um sure. so the ministries indicated to us uh, or indicated at the moment that they will start rolling out freshwater farm plans from next year, the um, draft legislation we're expecting out sometime in the next couple of months, um, in which we'll be able to have a look at and go through the submission process on. But um, the indication is from next year, it will be rolled out uh, to over several years to a number of regions each year, but we've had no indication of which regions are going to be up first. Um, and then within that region, uh, my understanding is the regional councils may have some discretion, but again, we until we see what those final regulations look like, um, we don't know exactly how that's going to land. Great, thanks very much, Heather. Now, look, we're just, um, we're just coming up to 8.30 there now, so look, I'm going to just put an end to those questions. Um, if there are any questions that we haven't covered, or if there's anything that you really want to ask, please pop it into the, into the uh, chat or um, feel free to text it through to the number 027 702 9832. And we'll make sure that we get those answers shared and, um, and put out to, to everyone that's attended. 
Uh, so I'd just like to thank uh, all of our um, contributors to today, DRNZ, DNU Industry New Zealand, Federated Farmers, Foundation for Able Research, Ministry for Primary Industries, and Beef and Lamb New Zealand. And just as way of a summary, yeah, just make sure that you're aware of what uh, the new rules and regulations are. And if your local regional council has any specific rules, um, they're also a really good place to get uh, information from, as well as the industry partners. Make sure that you've got a uh, winter grazing plan uh, ready for winter 2023 and have it written down. Uh, make sure that you're looking after your animal welfare requirements um, and also doing what you can to minimise the environmental effects of winter grazing. So I'd just like to thank everybody for, for your time um, and I'll get the uh, speakers just to stay on the call afterwards, but I'll get everyone else to um, jump off the call. So thank you very much for your time today um, and uh, good luck with winter 2023. Thank you very much.